I'm going to give a quick uh, background for computer for data from the Falcon perspective. Um, I'm going to talk about scaling blockchain computation and a bunch of work that we have uh, on that. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about cloud, com cloud computing as a background for the decentralized computing networks part. I'll talk about a, a triangle thing that, um, uh, that I think is a key consideration when thinking about des designing decentralized computing networks. Uh, I'll give, give an overview of a bunch of common parts that we should be working on um, detangling and making libraries for. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk about kind of the contrast of those from specific networks. And the goal of that part of the session is to uh, kind of get the whole room thinking about which parts of these are meant to be specific to a computational network um, or common libraries that everybody should be kind of contributing. And I want to finish up by talking about IPLD programs, which is a specific part that is missing in order to enable a lot of this stuff. Uh, cool, let's go. So um, I'm going to assume a lot of familiarity with Falcon already. Uh, I'm just going to kind of blaze through this just to page this kind of um, stuff into your mind. So this is the community roadmap. Um, there's a lot of people working on, on you know, a ton of things here. Um, there's an enormous amount of growth in the storage provider world. So there's a lot of SPs um, that are scaling up their operations, both the capacity and the, uh, and the storage. Uh, you can see kind of like the growing amount of um, useful storage with uh, Falcon Plus and so on. Uh, my favorite graph of these right now is the new committed deals in terabytes, which you know just crossed over a petabyte in the last few days. The last few day, or last week, the last few days have been have gone back down. I don't know why, but uh, let's get back up there. Uh, one important component of all of this is that um, the whole strategy of using developer-oriented on-ramps, so this is, means specific products tuned to a specific use case, has been extremely successful. So um, when you're building a pretty general computational platform, uh, you run the risk of being so general that it's very difficult to use. Um, and we not only run that risk, we, um, uh, we are uh, very much so in, in, in that um, environment where because the power is so large, uh, you end up with extremely complex interfaces. But then when you create a very specific uh, use case oriented developer on ramp, you can narrow down the, the complexity, focus the, the APIs, focus the marketing, focus the, um, uh, the, the tooling and so on, uh, just to target that use case. And that has been extremely successful. So I would imagine a whole bunch of these will, will emerge. So already people think, I'm, been in a bunch of discussions with people thinking about video.storage and archive.storage and um, all, all different kinds of uh, different on-ramps. Uh, the other, one other component is uh, we should be able to see large scale, um, we should be able to see faster use of the capacity um, by being able to use uh, snap deals. Uh, the retrieval stuff is, is coming online, so we should be able to get sub-second retrieval now for uh, whatever we uh, think is in the hot data set. So that means uh, ahead of time we can identify specific segments of data and then uh, pre-cache those around the world uh, to be able to retrieve them quickly. Uh, and of course, the most important piece of all of this is the FEM. So the FEM is in active development now. Um, uh, milestone 0 0.5, I think, shipped last week or some, some point recently. Um, and the FEM milestone 1 is, is ahead. Um, I think what everybody really needs is milestone two, which is kind of, I think, Q3, Q4-ish, uh, uh, sometime this year. Uh, if you're not familiar with FEM, highly recommend going to check it all out um, and understand kind of the ideas behind it and so on. Uh, the big takeaway for this conversation is that you should think of it as a, a piece of code that enables the Falcon blockchain to run arbitrary programs um, and, to, and that it's oriented as a hypervisor, so it's meant to be able to run multiple different foreign runtimes. So that means think of EVM contracts and being able to run those on top of Filecoin, um, being able to run many other different kinds of smart contract machines. Uh, but another com very important component here is if you look at the bottom of the FEM, there's another interface here that we haven't kind of explicitly ripped out, uh, which is maybe described as IPLD-WASM here which is just the, all of what you need to be able to execute IPLD-oriented programs. Um, if you were thinking about it as like an IPFS VM, uh, that's like a component that we're going to pull out uh, without all of the Falcon-specific or blockchain-specific components, and then take that VM and now make it available to IPFS implementations. So imagine arbitrary IPFS implementations being able to run arbitrary code uh, by addressing it with, uh, with IPLD linking. 
Uh, cool. So there's a cool website for FEM that kind of describes a bunch of use cases. Uh, the key one here is decentralized compute, which is what we're all here to talk about. Uh, all right, now let's get into the um, exciting stuff here. So the, the there's a, several talks that people have given over the last year or two talking about different kinds of um, computation over data that you, that you could do. Uh, this Raul's talk uh, announcing the FEM that kind of goes through a bunch of different use cases, the ones on the bottom left, and kind of walks through the kinds of things that are going to become possible. Um, I've given one on blockchain computation models that kind of traces different ways of doing uh, computation at scale. Uh, and kind of the, the thrust of that talk is talking about how, in reality, uh, we're going to do the same thing that the cloud computing world did, which is get to a point where we can do task schedulers and uh, standard job issuance and so on in the traditional way. Um, just we're going to kind of enable that through uh, blockchains. And kind of, uh, yeah, I'll dive into more detail there. Uh, one thing that's already starting to happen is that we're, we have already a whole setup where you have large-scale Falcon storage providers um, with a ton of CPUs and GPUs that can then be used for computation. And I think Charles is here. Who, uh, there's a picture of him uh, demoing the computational platform that he already built. Uh, he and his team built this notebook interface where you could uh, run, I think, IPython notebooks and already issue computation to, um, to the SPs in, uh, uh, that they run. This, kind of, this is the kind of thing that we want to enable just at large scale with arbitrary kinds of uh, computing and so on. Uh, so there's another whole part of this, which is um, there's a bunch of work that we're doing to scale the amount of uh, computation that you can do in a, in a blockchain. And that re there's a whole kind of other project uh, uh, run by Consensus Lab uh, that you can look at that describes the kind of like next generation consensus protocols to be able to do this. Um, I think I'll... Yeah, I think I'll, I'll dive a little bit more into detail on this. Maybe, yeah, the, the specifics here that you should be aware of is we're really trying to target the level of scalability that the traditional cloud has. So most blockchains today have this extremely slow uh, transactional throughput where, you know, I think the, the fastest blockchain today is what, like 10,000 or 100,000 transactions per second, which is laughable compared to the cloud, right? So the cloud um, uh, does orders of magnitude more, more work. Let me see if I can. Uh, so the entire blockchain space has to reach this kind of large scale, traditional web scale or internet scale level of computation. Um, and so by you know, back of the envelope calculation, like that really means billions of transactions per second or trillions of transactions per second. And so that's where the blockchain world is headed. Um, that, is, that is many orders of magnitude away from where we are today, uh, but that's what we're building towards. Uh, one other component here is that most computing applications require really fast finality. This whole nonsense of you only get finality you know, 10, 10 seconds um, after is not going to work. So when, when you deal with large-scale computation, you need to be able to do very fast local finality with, within a single data center, uh, ideally uh, sub-millisecond. Um, and you know, if you're in a data center, you, you can deal with things in like the hundreds of microseconds and so on. So that's the, the kind of operation that you want. Um, and how, do, how are we going to get blockchains to get there? And th this is the, the tree structure you see in the top right uh, is how we'll get there. Is we'll use um, consensus scaling techniques to split off uh, consensus groups to be able to operate um, in, in small regions uh, so we can deal with like, the speed of light problem. Right? So the, the, the reason blockchains are slow is speed of light. Uh, there's a whole other talk that you can go watch about all of this. If, if this sounds really interesting, um, go talk to Alfonso. Uh, if, or go watch the talks that, uh, that have been put out about all this. So super exciting stuff. Uh, one, important, uh, one, important, one important thing that, uh, to remember here is um, one, up, one really simple, cheap approach to compute over data is to hang entire computational rings on the bottom of that tree. So the very bottom of that tree, you can spin up a very small consensus group with, like I don't know, five nodes, ten nodes, and then run arbitrary jobs there. So... Um, I, probably that'll get unpacked over the day or next, next day. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is the blockchain world is um, experiment, experimenting with new kinds of media um, and new kinds of programmable media. So all the NFT stuff um, is just scratching the surface. We're now already seeing 3D environments and 3D rooms and <clears throat> video and imagine now... Um, dynamic, uh, experiential video and art and so on. So all of that stuff is going to require lots of computational um, uh, tools hooked into 
the blockchain world. So that means not only um, real time, but kind of post processing stuff. So imagine a, a, all the traditional creative processing pipelines of like dealing with all of the media assets and so on, and being able to deal with all of that computation entirely in a decentralized context. Like that's where all of this is headed, and we're pretty far away from, from being able to do that. Um, and all of these pieces can get you know, put together into the, the kind of metaverse kind of structure. Uh, one other thing for people to remember, there's a lot of flashing for the different uh, proof of stake blockchains. It's like the blockchain party. Um, uns, 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 uns. Uh, no, the, so the, all of these programs are going to, so all of these blockchains are gonna in, have a bunch of different programs and so on, and they're all gonna wanna do large scale data processing. Um, all of them already wanna do large scale data storage and a ton of them are using Falcoin and a bunch of bridges are getting built out. Um, now imagine being able to do all of the computational processing um, surrounding all of those. Uh, uh, cool, so that's kind of like the you know, lightning fast background. So um, hopefully I didn't uh, leave anyone in the, in the dust, but there's a bunch of talks that, that describe all of this. All I wanted to do was kind of page that into your mind uh, so that we then get to specifics. Um, this is a, one of the latest drawings that we've been using to represent kind of the, how Filecoin roughly works, where you have kind of storage clients using these on-ramps uh, to then store a bunch of data in storage providers, then these, um, then all of this data gets indexed by these indexer tools, uh, and then we have retrieval providers pulling the data out and serving it out to retrieval clients. Now, of course, some storage clients go directly to storage providers and back out, but those are mostly large, large data, um, large clients. So the whole goal is being able to run jobs there. Why there and not anywhere else? Because data is really heavy. Data has gravity. Once you've moved petabytes somewhere, you really don't want to move them again. So you want to move all of the computation right where the data is, uh, run it there, take the outputs, store them in the same network, and then allow parties to view that data from there. Now, in some cases, you are going to have to move data. Of course, you can't like have everything. Um, sometimes you'll need to run some job across a bunch of data in different places. And so then you can run pieces of the computation there, take the intermediate outputs, ship those intermediate outputs elsewhere, and then combine those things. So think of like the traditional MapReduce structure where you're kind of like running a whole bunch of the initial programs wherever the data is, take the intermediate outputs, move those around, because uh, they're usually a lot smaller, not always, but usually, um, and then be able to kind of uh, do that kind of stuff. Uh, luckily, we are sitting on 20 to 30 years of excellent distributed systems programming tooling, so there's tons of stuff out there on how to do this really well, how to split computation jobs, and so on. And so the, the goal is to kind of leverage as much as possible from that world um, while providing like the, the necessary hooks to make it work in a centralized context. Uh, cool, so let's talk about scaling the competition. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, I wasn't sure if I had this whole slide over here. So just for a benchmark, um, the internet today deals with, you know, can you, is that too small? Can you see that right now? Maybe there's a slide right ne near you. Just like spend a moment looking at that scale. And in addition to all of those operations, there's tons of backend pipeline jobs that have to run over all of that data to make it useful, right? So you upload a picture to Instagram, you upload a video to YouTube, tons of computational jobs run on top of that to make it usable and consumable by other people. So this is why there aren't any consumer web apps or consumer apps for, for people in blockchains yet that are decentralized. It's because all of that work can't be done today in a fully decentralized context. And we need to get to the point where like the, the computational networks can enable that. Uh, so, you know, just if you're wondering about use cases, just refer back to this one diagram, look at any one of these applications and be like, oh, yeah, uh, what needs to happen to an image? Like, you, it needs to be rescaled. It needs to be, um, you have to do machine learning vision rec so you can tag your friends. You have to, like, push it to people's feeds. You have to, like, collate all the feeds. You have to, like, index all of that stuff. You have to, you know, draw all these relationships between pieces. All of those kinds of things are the data pipelines that we want to be able to run um, in a decentralized context. Uh, cool. So... Um, the, yeah, let's dive into um, competition models in a moment. Um, before I get there, uh, just to like kind of beat a dead horse, today there's no single blockchain protocol that can handle internet transactional volumes, and none of them can handle mission-critical deployments. So this means um, what is defined as a mission-critical deployment is something that can run when part of the internet starts disappearing or when your, your uh, community or network gets disconnected from the rest of the world. So imagine like if you something bad happens and suddenly everything falls apart and like nothing works like 
cell phones don't work, um, can't send messages to anybody, and so on. Like that, obviously we don't want to uh, build systems like that, but unfortunately, that's what blockchains are today. Uh, we need to get out of that spot. And that's where all the um, consensus scaling work is going, is to enable um, entire consensus groups to work through network partitions and with, without having to deal with like the speed of light problem. So as you're thinking of designing computational networks, don't, don't, like, don't limit your thinking to think about the current blockchains of today that you know, only deal with small transactional throughputs or where gas is extremely expensive. Just think of the schedulers actually being able to do a lot more. But think of these schedulers as being not, their, not, not just having one single scheduler, but having one per consensus group. So if you have, say, one scheduler inside of one data center, um, you, can do, you actually can run a bunch of contract or a bunch of transactions in a blockchain context, in a decentralized context with cryptocurrency just within a, within a single data center. So yeah, that's where like, all this is headed. Now, of course, if you want to ship this here, um, there you do have to assume one large blockchain and so on. Um, well, actually, yeah, I'll just cover this quickly. So um, I think everybody here is fairly familiar with the cloud computing world. Um, pretty much most applications that you use today rely on cloud systems, um, either private or public systems. And you have these like massive data centers dedicated to all of this. And your, whatever program you're running has like tons of other computation that runs around it to schedule it, coordinate it, move around the data, and so on. So you have these enormous um, infrastructure projects to enable like running your random little like counter <laughs> uh, program or like your little like image tagger. Um, and so I think like whenever you're like fishing for use cases or whatever, just refer back to, you know, like whatever main application you, you would like to run and then kind of start decomposing it out into what pipelines you think might have to run or like look it, on, look it up online. Um, I want to kind of like talk a little bit about um, this stuff. So at the end of the day, there's an enormous amount of code today that is already structured to run on the traditional cloud systems. And so that means VMs or containers. And it would be really cool if blockchains could run all of that. Um, unfortunately, it's pretty hard because those VMs and those containers are not deterministic. And so you can't guarantee that you can run the same thing twice. And that's verifiable. So I, like, I think it would be great to get, get there. It's actually quite difficult to do this well. Um, I would recommend like, going after much simpler versions first, going after kind of um, e things that are easy to verify, and then later kind of doubling back and then figuring out how to do this well. Um, I do think that blockchains will have to solve this problem well, or you know, the, the cloud system uh, shift won't happen. Um, because there's just tons of stuff that people have built over the last 30 to 50 years that needs to run. Yeah, 50 years really. Like there's, you know, there's like random Fortran stuff running in AWS, you can bet. You can totally go back and look at most of the cloud computing papers um, and think about how those, those architectures might apply today. So you can think of like Borg and Kubernetes and so on um, and kind of like squint at it and say like, oh yeah, the, you know, the Kubernetes master thing, that could totally be a scheduler on the blockchain. Um, these kubelet things... Um, these could be specific uh, jobs that run anywhere that kind of interact with this master and then um, figure out the job specs and, and so on. Now, the problem, though, is that you need to make this verifiable or, um, and ideally kind of incentive compatible um, so you can get correctness out of the, out of the code. Um, but in general, if you try and like, fit the same kind of structure, uh, things, things will be way, way, way easier. Uh, and you know, that's just one program of, or one system of many. Um, you can think of like, about Lambda or Cloudflare workers and so on. Like all of that stuff is um, super interesting and super ripe for um, for bringing into the blockchain context, uh, especially Cloudflare workers, uh, where you can kind of run computing jobs like very close to the user. Like that's also super interesting. That's kind of like a different pr problem from r compute over data, which is kind of more about running computing pipelines over um, over long data. So running computing pipelines is probably easier from like a latency, computing latency perspective. Running jobs close to the user is a different, it, it, you, you want to minimize latency to the, to the end user. Uh, I'll plug a couple of things here, which is kind of, there's a whole set of different um, zero knowledge proofs oriented or, or um, verifiable computation oriented systems, things like um, Metaproof and um, uh, Lurk, which is the, the I, th I think Metaproof got renamed to Lurk. Um, and there's a bunch of other languages that enable you to write proofs about the computation. Um, lean into that. Like whenever the computation is not too expensive, like you can do that. Um, and also reflect that fully homomorphic encryption is coming as well. Uh, so it's a whole other um, possibility. So which brings me to the triangle. So 
Um, I thought a lot about this for the last, I don't know, five, eight years, um, about kind of like, and, and it seemed to me then, five, eight years ago, that this was going to be an extremely difficult problem to solve, and that pretty much nobody was going to figure it out, because everyone tries to solve everything, and the answer is you can't. Um, why can't you? So th there are three key properties that you want in any kind of decentralized computation system. You want to be able to have uh, performance, verifiability, and privacy. What does that mean? Performance means uh, you want the computation to be cheap, uh, you want it to be fast, you want it to be low latency to the user. Um, so that means uh, low computational complexity. You don't want a lot of overhead for running the thing, right? Like if you blow up the computation up by 10x, like that's really expensive. Um, also, if it takes forever to run or on an unbounded amount of time like that, that also doesn't work. Um, and ideally, like it shouldn't require massive amounts of computation or hardware or, or specialized hardware and so on. So it, you want, if you want things to be high performance, you kind of want to be kind of toward, towards one side of the triangle. Then you enter, um, then you have a verifiability requirement. So in the traditional private cloud, you can just trust the brand, right? Like there's an economic approach to verifiability. If you find out that like AWS is secretly changing your computation, you're going to freak out about it. You're going to write a, a big blog post. People are going to look into it. They're going to see that that's right. And then Amazon stocks are going to fall. And then you know uh, a whole set of like um, problems are going to happen for Amazon. And so you get like this very, very uh, successful economic verifiability over the computation. You don't have to worry that Amazon is going to change your stuff. Um, now, you can use similar kinds of structures in the uh, decentralized context and replace brand with stake. So you can require stake in the picture. You can run kind of optimistic computations um, and then check them later. Or you can do, you can bring like the crypto, uh, cryptography to bear and instead use zero knowledge proofs or MPC and so on to like actually get um, cryptographic correctness proofs. And like that's a much better place to be. However, those are less performant. Those uh, proving systems introduce a bunch of additional runs or other computation they need to run that just decre um, decrease the performance, right? So there's like this trade-off between verifiability and performance. The more verifiability you want, um, the lower performance it's going to be. And um, the, this gets worse with privacy. So this is required for, by most applications. So you get a, into a situation where like m most real world applications deal with user data in some way. You want hard guarantees about privacy there. Uh, you want the data to be encrypted at rest. You ideally want the computers not to like look at the data. Um, and so that's where this becomes extremely difficult in centralized computation because in the traditional world, you can lean on brand again with that same kind of economic structure. Um, and sure, like some data does leak, some data is lost, but not that much. Now, unfortunately, stake is way harder to make this work with um, because it's extremely difficult to detect that something is actually leaked. Um, so this is where you ideally do want to introduce cryptographic primitives to get uh, certainty. But the cryptographic primitives for this are orders of magnitude more expensive. So that this is where you end up with full, fully homomorphic encryption or MPC or things like that that are just dramatically more expensive than, than the traditional stuff. So, so, so again, this is why right now we don't have any, any good, good setups. Um, so th these are like, you, you know, ideally you want all of these three to the fullest extent. You want everything to be super high performance, you want it verifiable, and you want it private. Um, Unfortunately, these trade-offs uh, drop out of the laws of physics. So you can't just, like, if you want to introduce any kind of additional computation to, to get some verifiability, you will necessarily be, go slower. And if you're not controlling the physical atoms and energy that's going into your computation, if that's controlled by somebody else, you will certainly require some additional computation to make sure that they're not uh, cheating in some way or that they're not um, leaking your data. So um, necessarily, there's like this, this unfortunate trade-off where it is impossible to get um, you know, perfect performance. Now you can get pretty close, and over time our, improve, uh, our cryptographic methods have been improving a lot. Like today, um, tons of methods are orders mounted faster than when they were first proposed, so all of these things will improve. Uh, but you can sort of like think of creating a map of the different kind of techniques in different uh, sort of spots. Um, and this is kind of... Uh, roughly where these might land. Um, now, this is not like ideal, but like the, the whole point is to, is to show that the different kind of specific technique and specific approach will land you somewhere else. Um, well, what's worse here is that each of these techniques mean wildly different performance trade-offs. So some of these are many orders of magnitude slower. So two orders of magnitude slower, five orders of magnitude slower, and so on. Um, that also means, and, and they also have different verifiability protocols. So for example, if you run things optimistically and then you want to check them, so you run a program first, you store the outputs, you then later at some point in time, you randomly choose to check some of it 
and you will run some of that computation again, that means it's a high latency operation, right? You, you uh, run the program once, you can't commit to it yet, you have to wait until later, and then later you check it and then you can submit it. Ideally, you would be able to write a proof and just immediately get verification. But if you do that, now you're, you end up with like much higher performance requirements um, or potentially new hardware. So um, people are trying to scale all the zero knowledge proof stuff by producing specific hardware to tune for that. So, so again, the point is you end up with very different protocols here. Um, so this means each of these techniques, each of these technologies yields different protocol schemes, different security properties, different computational complexity, different network use, different hardware, and so on. And ultimately, this will also mean different use cases. And that means different users and probably different brands. So like, you know, five years ago when I was thinking about this, I was like, oh yeah, this means like, there's not gonna be a single network that can claim to be just the decentralized computing network for, um, for crypto. And every network that tries to do that is gonna fail because we're not failed, but like, it's not gonna really be able to, to um, match that, that uh, requirement because all of the complexity here be between all these approaches. So there's two, two basic options, I think. One option is to do different networks, which is way cheaper, way easier, um, and kind of like compatible with how the crypto world um, is following this. The other approach is to use programming languages to under the hood, as you write a program, under the hood, take pieces of it, and then run it in a different system, depending on what part of the program requires. The machine learning world has gone in that direction. So today you can write a machine learning um, program in Python or something like that, and then describe the kinds of operations you wanna run, and the, the compiler tooling is so good that like it'll grab chunks of the program, expand it out to some other you know, large scale computation meant to run in some particular system like TensorFlow or whatever, um, and then piece all of it back together when it gives, gives it back to you. Um, GPUs sort of like work this way. So we could, we could theoretically go in that direction and then just plug in all of these special purpose types of things in there. Um, but I think like that is way harder, way slower. And the team required to be able to do that is like so big. Um, that I, I just like wouldn't bet on that approach. I would bet on the approach to start with a bunch of networks, build all of these things out, and then later you can unify them with programming languages. So these are not mutually exclusive. Um, I think one of them is way, way more likely to work. Uh, cool, so now let's talk about common parts. Uh, so, you know, kind of architecture wise, most of these systems, no matter what the techniques that you use, um, will probably follow computing pipelines that are pretty similar. You have a bunch of users, they're submitting programs, those programs enter a scheduler, the scheduler picks a set of workers, or the workers kind of like register with the scheduler and pick, pick things off a queue. Um, those workers do the work and they submit the results and then eventually the user gets, gets the results back. Um, you might have some auditing, different parts of the picture, maybe the worker submit a proof, maybe the auditing happens afterwards, a separate step, but for the most part, the computing pipeline is pretty similar. Uh, what this means is that you can write composable tooling for all of this um, that just kind of be useful across all these networks. Um, and you, we probably need some kind of spec here for decentralized versions of these because a lot of specs for computing pipelines exist in a centralized world, but the decentralized world needs to introduce some auditing or some verifiability in a, in a bunch of key places. So that means that there's an opening for writing a pretty good spec for how to do these things. Um, uh, component two, programming languages. Some of these technologies like zero knowledge proofs and FHE and so on will re potentially require a, um, a DSL, but ideally users want any language. So how, do you, how are you gonna enable that? VMs, so you know, it's VMs all the way down, take whatever um, language the user wants and then compile it down to whatever DSL you need um, and then run that. Uh, thankfully, we don't have to do much here because like this is how the world works. Um, now, because of that, because all the systems use virtualization to encapsulate all of these things, um, we should pick like a really good um, target. I think WASM is a pretty safe one. The, the world has, for the most part, moved to WASM. LVM IR is also a good one. Um, good thing is you can like move from one to the other. So WASM is better because it's stable. Like it, it's a deterministic compilation output, um, and you can do that to LVM IR, but it's not not as good. Um, we need kind of like the the IPLD subset of FVM to be defined. So this is something that like Raul and Steven and others could could work uh, could. Uh, they can't work on that, they're really busy. Maybe ask them how to go do this. Um, we also need to kind of define the, the program formats. So that means we need to think about what it looks like to create a function, feed an input in, into that function, take the outputs, and then store those outputs. All of those pieces, so how we define the function, how we define the inputs, how do we define the outputs. Um, ideally, we wanna write in a pretty general way that's independent of a specific technique or technology or whatever, and it's kind of parameterized so that we can come up with like one program spec that just can run you know, arbitrary things. 
Um, we want to lean on the fact that you know, compilation steps can be introduced anywhere. So the world is really used to compiler tooling and different kinds of tooling mangling programs. So you got some hard problem to solve, see if you can figure it out with some compiler tooling, and then you can introduce it somewhere and the user doesn't have to worry about it. So you know, really, really lean on building the tools. But you, know, you, can't, you can't not solve the problem, not write the tool, and then expect the problem to be solved. So you either like, you know, get the user to solve it or build a good compiler tool. Um, schedulers. So I think the schedulers are probably pretty general and are, can probably be the same across all these systems. I don't think you need system-specific schedulers. So that means that we should be able to, to create like the same general schedulers that could be used by all these different networks. Um, and uh, there's basically two tiers of scheduler, and it's something that um, uh, uh, David and I were, used, were talking about like a, a bunch of months ago. There's kind of like a system-wide network-oriented scheduler that is meant to run entire pipelines. And then a single pipeline might have its own local scheduler for your program that decides about you know, how to run, how many steps uh, and so on. When that, and that's where you put in all the knowledge about whether or not to kind of keep running or abort or something like that. Um, but either way, these kind of like two types of schedulers, there might be more types, but I think basically you can abstract out all of the specific technology stuff and then just think of the schedulers as pretty general. Um, and that means that we could be building these general scheduler tools um, Right, either have a spec or an implementation that then can run in, in um, arbitrary uh, smart contract platforms. Um, now, monitoring. This is a really key part of these systems. As soon as you have like thousands of jobs running or tens of thousands of job runnings, you need to know what the hell is going on because this gets incredibly difficult to debug. Um, you, have, you, have, you have tons of like distributed systems going on. You have random users submitting random stuff, doing who knows what. Um, you need to be able to like know exactly what's going on across the whole system in specific nodes and what they're pulling off, specific jobs and so on. So you need like a ton of tooling that is going to show and and um, clearly visualize or clearly like error check um, what's going on across the system. Uh, good news, uh, the whole world has been doing this for you know 20 years, so a lot of it can be adapted, but it probably will need to be different because here we're going to have to deal with um, looking at blockchains and looking at specific decentralized nodes that may or may not lie to you. So you end up in like a different spot. Um, so we probably have to write new monitor, monitoring tooling. But again, this I think can be really general. This is not kind of network specific. Um, then kind of all the inputs and outputs, we can kind of um, put those as part of the, the IPLD program spec. We can figure out how to like have like a common wrapper data format or something to be able to kind of identify all these things um, and then kind of make all of these pieces uh, Chainable. This is, I think, a, a very significant step towards getting that unification of programming later. Because if you want to run something in like MPC and then FHE or like, you know, um, in a, in a some other, you know, zero knowledge proofs or whatever, if all of these things speak the same uh, input and output data formats, then it's all going to get easier, right? So, writing general schedulers and writing running the I/O program spec, that I think could be the highest leverage thing that anybody could do to get to these kind of like unification of, of uh, uh, computing networks later. Uh, the you know, UX is really important. So recognize that these these systems will have these specific networks will have a subset of targets. So some of them, for example, if they require specialized hardware, they're not going to be able to run anywhere. Some other networks might be able to leverage things like the GPUs on your mobile device, um, and then kind of target to uh, target that. And so that means like specific worker node UX might have to emerge, but a bunch of them then will have like subsets that are very similar. So think of like the general scheduler, think of like the general monitoring tools, some amount of that is gonna be the same. Um, and then think of like writing worker node UX that's like meant to be reshaped by whoever creates a specific network. Uh, the last thing is the, like all of this stuff is not gonna work unless there is excellent developer UX. So at the end of the day, people need to use the system, people need to write like complex uh, programs with it. They need like extremely good tools. They need like super intuitive ways to write the job specs. They need to like be able to run the things. They need to be able to simulate the thing running to test their own program. They need excellent debugging tool, excellent monitoring tools. They want like accounting that is reasonable and works with their organization, which might be like a corporation or might be a DAO or might be an individual. They need like access controls to the results. So that means like capability crypto um, that enables like the encryption of the results. Um, and they need excellent docs, right? Like ref tutorial and so on. So again, here, the world has an enormous amount of like really good examples to learn from, but this is an enormous amount of work. So the developer UX, to get this good, to get this to be adopted by a ton of people, um, this is like tens to hundreds of people's work is gonna go into like creating excellent developer UX. Um, and so 
before you have excellent developer UX, don't expect a lot of adoption. Just expect kind of like maybe blockchain specific world adoption. Uh, cool. The um, so I kind of like really want to encourage this entire um, summit to really think about like splitting out the common system tooling from the decentralized computing network specific tooling, right? So um, all the stuff that can be common and create libraries around, think of it like building like the Lilliput P for computer for data. You want to create a bunch of like little pluggable pieces that can then be pieced together and you can then write a specific decentralized computer network, right? Whether it's an optimistic one or a CKP one or, or an FHE one or whatever. Um, and by the way, like the incentive structures of these, because they have to, the incentive structures have to be related to the verification process and the, and the proving process and so on, then they look different everywhere. So um, if you want to write incentive structures for an FHE network or a CKP network, they look very different than an optimistic network. That's another reason why it's way easier to just write different networks. Um, but the point is, like, re really think about, like, um, Bacalao being a project where we build one of these specific networks in order to build all this common system tooling. So then we can enable a lot of groups to build a bunch of specific networks, right? So it's like, we, you have to build a system that actually works to, to test it out and to like really, you know, make sure that um, you have a real thing that will really work. And that ideally gets to like really high performance, like very large scale, hundreds of thousands of nodes and or like millions and, and millions or tens of millions of jobs and use that to like then drive improvement of all of this common system tooling. So then, so that then, you know, arbitrary, other decentralized computing networks can be built. Um, uh, cool. So the last thing uh, I wanted to touch on was like IPLD programs, which is kind of like this piece of the, the FEM uh, diagram, uh, where uh, there needs to be kind of like a, like a spec written about that, of like really figuring out what it means to run a WASM program, hash link through IPLD and so on. And then kind of like, that is kind of like the, there was a thing called like the IPFS VM, that's what it would be. Um, maybe this is a subset of FVM, uh, I don't know, but I think we ba basically need that. Um, and we want to be able to like enable arbitrary computation. Um, so this is not just smart contracts, right? This means like very large programs um, potentially. Um, and then kind of being able to do kind of program execution, function invocation and so on. So I think like this is like a great topic for a, um, a kind of um, session. All right, cool. I'm going to stop there. All right, thanks so much.